All right. Uh, hi, I'm Tom. I'm from Redbubble. Um, one of the um, conditions of our sponsorship tonight was that uh, one of us gets up and does a talk. So um, we had a bit of a thing internally and nobody wanted to come. So uh, you'll have to listen to me, sorry. Um, as I said, I wrote my first Swift today. I've got a prolonged Objective-C experience and a bunch of other things, but I haven't really done a lot of Swift. I kind of joked on the Slack channel last week, I think, that I could do a talk on GraphQL. Um, and I say it graph, not graph, uh, apologies. But um, yeah, that didn't really go down. So I'm going to talk about GraphQL in Swift. So Matt gave me the idea, so thanks, Matt. I spent like. Because I want to solve the problem myself. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I've solved the problem. I spent like an hour this afternoon knocking something together. Um, if you want to know about GraphQL, come talk to me. We use it a lot. Um, this is our server, it's written in Scala, just for Matt. Uh, it's in production, it works really well. Yep. Awesome. So I'm going to try and create something that connects live to the Scala API. I'm going to connect to the local one running on my machine because the one in production is secured. Um, so I don't know if anyone's done anything with GraphQL. Uh, I might show you GraphQL very briefly. The thing essentially on the left is GraphQL. There's a couple of ways you can think of GraphQL. It's not a transport protocol. It's not a, um, it's not a graph query language. It's essentially a way of, if you've ever done an SQL, which you probably have, it's the, the you know, select star, it's the project clause in the SQL query. That's essentially what you're doing. You're creating a thing to send to a server somewhere or to send to a, a data execution engine to get some data back. Uh, we're serializing this over HTTP, uh, using JSON, all that's not GraphQL. Um, if you want to know the gory details, go read about it. Uh, selfless plug, I've done a bunch of talks on it, so go look up my talks. Um, but essentially this is the GraphQL query here, and you'll notice the shape of the input matches the shape of the output, and that's intentional, that's a deliberate thing, um, which is actually one of the really powerful features. This thing you're looking at here is not GraphQL, it's a thing called GraphQL, which is a React-based web little single page app. Boo. Boo. <laughs> we do a lot of React. Um, oh, <laughs> I don't, but we do. Um, <laughs> it's good for the web. It's immutable. It's like functional programming for JavaScript. Um, so this is one of our endpoints that we can hit. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with GraphQL. Since everyone wants to know about it, let me just um, copy that into my paste buffer. So one of the really nice things about GraphQL is this interactive query building. You won't get this in the app if you're kind of using, we just use kind of text files to hold our queries. But you can run, um, I'm on the network, right, Jesse? Like I've got internet? Yep. yep. No downloading Xcode. No, I'm not going to download Xcode. I did that this afternoon. Yes, So let me just show you something interesting. I'm going to ask you guys to pick a, an image here. When I get a web page. There any? This is really small. Any images that anyone likes? Pizza. Pizza. Oh. Pizza sloth. <coughs> so I'm going to grab this here. I'm going to create a query interactively. Um, yeah, GraphQL doesn't like resizing, so apologies for that. Country. I'll, I'll blow it back up again. So it's probably not obvious, but I'm just kind of hitting command space here. I'll blow that back up. So I'm going to ask for related work. Can you drag the white? Right right yep. Button? You get really nice things like this. Field related works requires a country type, a country code. That's pretty good. I'll give it a country code. I'll just shrink it up so I can see it. Do you have to structure your tables in a specific way? You use GraphQL? Structure your tables? What's a table? <laughs> um, so GraphQL is just an execution engine. You give it a query and it figures out how to resolve that in the most efficient way. You've got a thing called a resolver. Um, 
and you effectively what you do is you attach a resolver. You can think of it like a function body. So this is effectively uh, these these translate on the back end to functions, and there's a function that says, given some context, like I'm within a work, I know how to find an image, which is usually just an access or a property lookup. But sometimes they're actually going and doing fetches. Um, our GraphQL API is stateless. There's no database. It aggregates 17 backend services that we have. So if you ask for related works, for example, it goes and looks up the related works, gets their IDs, and then goes and fetches the information about those works. So it's, it's like a web service lookup aggregation proxy kind of engine. Matt? If you have 17 backend services that you're querying, yep. what happens if the query takes two minutes? What happens if the query takes two minutes? Good question. <laughs> yes, and I don't want to get into this. <laughs> we have timeouts, is the short answer. So anyway, there's stuff there. We get back things. That's really awesome. So in the interest of getting into Swift, let's do that. So that's our GraphQL query. Um, let me find the one I saved earlier. So this is our categories. These are the categories of products that we sell. Men's. Um, eventually we'll have women's. We'll have homeware. We'll have kids. We'll have all sorts of categories. So that's really interesting. We can parse that data. People are used to doing JSON parsing, I'm assuming. Um, again, I haven't done a lot of Swift, but I think Argo is a Swift library, right? I'm going to sound ridiculous. True. It's based on Argonaut, which is a Scala library. Yep. Um, uh, we use Circe, which is an Argonaut derivative on the server uh, that uses cats rather than Scala Z. But um, this is really interesting. I find it really interesting to do this uh, JSON parsing on the client because it's very simple, but it also gives you the benefits of the type safety that you get in other frameworks with a whole degree of simplicity. If you've ever done any Rails, this kind of convention over configuration, it seems similar to that, but you get type safety, which is fantastic. So if we look at our query, we can see that we have, actually, let's look at the result. You can see we've got a top level data element. It's a, it's a, it's a JSON object, and it has categories, which is an array that contains these categories. So what I've essentially done is just modeled that in Swift. So I've got a GraphQL response. I wasn't very creative with naming, so take it with a grain of salt. I've got a GraphQL response, and that's got a data element. So that matches up directly with the, with the JSON. And I've extended this codable interface. You might have heard of this called a codec before. It's basically a, a thing that allows encoding and decoding of types into or from JSON. So codable. I haven't gone to look at the type, so anyone who's had a look at it more than me, which is like half an hour, you can let me know. But it's a way of basically serializing. It's a combination of encodable yeah. and decodable. So it's just, yeah, I don't know what that looks like in Swift. I'm assuming it's just extending two things. Um, so we've got a data element, data extends data container, and you can see there's these references between things. It's just like a normal object graph. Again, this thing is codable. There's categories. It's an array of categories. So you c I don't know if you remember what the... Um, Let's jump back here, what it looked like. These things are categories. They've got an array of categories. Categories have names. Categories have products. And you can see I'm just naturally describing this domain model on how things work. Um, just to be different, um, we have a thing called a display name for a product. We have various different names that we use in different circumstances, but one of them is like the short display name. And if you want to name the field within your class different to the thing in JSON, you can do that really easily. You just create this little embedded enum and you do this stuff. And again, I don't really know Swift, so I'm going to kind of hand wave over that. Um, but you can match those things up. So I don't know, this looks really simple to me. It's just some <coughs> classes that are structures. Do you want to have a second enum, which also sets You put other things inside it. So. Oh, no, suppose, suppose you do have a second enum. I don't know. <laughs> if you have a second enum, second enum, second thing extending community with the same like name equals something else. It's it's the code Display name and whatever else you need uh, only actual valid keys within a product. Uh, what, what would happen if you had a 
second line code equal to, we can also extend the string and coding yes. it gets inside the so product. So the code um, protocol yeah. is expecting all the coding keys. Oh, yeah. all the coding keys is the key, not the other thing. Yeah. Thank you. So what does that look like? Um, I built the world's best app this afternoon. Um, keep going while I get this running. There's a whole bunch of, um, there's a Git repo that this is on. There's some links here which you can kind of see. That's a really good blog post. You can't see the whole URL, but I'll show it in a sec. That's a really good blog post. It goes into a lot of details, date formatting, how to write custom codecs to do those things. It's quite good. So um, here's the awesome app we built this afternoon. I can't make it any bigger, I don't think. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? It's big enough. Um, no. So if I hit the magic button, it goes and hits the server. Let me just um, bring the server into scope so you can see that it's actually doing something. So I don't know if you saw that. It's actually logging out on the server. And what I'm doing is two things, which I'll show you the code in a minute. It's just displaying pretty printing that JSON that we get back from back end as well as just iterating over all of our categories, finding all their products, and then just printing the names out. So it's just mapping and flat mapping across um, those things. So if you look at the code, it's quite simple. Um, here's our GraphQL uh, URL. We're just making a query. That's a get form of a GraphQL URL rather than a post, which is normal. Um, yeah, don't, don't look too much at my code. Um, we're pulling the content of a URL. And then we're parsing it. So we create this decoder. We turn that string that we're getting back from the, from the server into an NS data. We decode it. So this thing's really interesting. This, this is the line that turns this thing into a type safe um, response. So this thing is of type GraphQL response, which is really interesting. And from there on, it's type safe. So that lets us do things like go into the response, ask for its data ask for its categories and then flat map across them to pull out the names of the products that are inside it. So we're fully type safe from here on. We can also kind of go the other way if we want to. Once we've got objects, we can turn them into JSON. So we've then got a JSON encoder. We're pretty printing that format, uh, that uh, object that we've just parsed, and we're turning it back into JSON and then we're displaying it in that view. So. Matt? Um, is pretty printed actually really needed? Um, is it needed? No. Displaying it on screen. But it looks pretty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's in this case, it, it, should, it should always be pretty printed. With colours as well? Yes. We don't pretty print from the server. Um, just to save bytes, but you know, it's gzip, so who knows if that's actually meaningful or not. But if it's not pretty printed, let's have a look. Um, sorry to see your question. So it looks really ugly, right? Like it doesn't look good when you're giving a talk. Yeah. Yeah, I made it awesome. It was awesome and now it's shit. Yeah. Did you look at what ugly golf shorts when you're doing that as well? No. Um is optional, it's optional just for everything It seems like this is like literally I spent an hour in Swift this afternoon and I was able to get this working. Um, so it seems really well thought out. It seems really easy. After having used both Argonaut and Circe on Scala, this is far easier to use. Like it took me probably a day to get up and running with those frameworks. And it's far simpler. It's got a good balance of type safety versus um, you know, expressiveness and simplicity. And there's not really a lot of magic. It seems to just work. And it seems like it's got really great extension points as well if you want to make things custom. Any other questions? Prasanna? None of us know the same the most. So we did a bit of a benchmark about which one is the fastest. There's a bunch of um, frameworks, Swift JSON and Argonauts and Argo and all those. And foundation is still the fastest. This is the second fastest, second fastest by right. a minor, a very small margin. So if 
50 years on in the, um, in, in the uh, uh, their bottom layer, if they start using this, it will be much faster than they are at the moment. It will be. The, the thing that I like about this is the type safetyness and the fact that you're not, you're not just parsing, like we do a lot of Ruby, and when you're not just parsing JSON into hashes and then operating with string keys, like that you've just completely lost type safety. I mean, you have in Ruby anyway, but you, it's even worse with hashes. So um, it's really great that you can get that level of type safety. Um, but I haven't checked out a bunch of edge cases, like what happens if those keys don't exist and how, what do the error modes look like? How can you recover from those? Just throws an exception. It's an exception. It's an error. Yes. It is an error. It's all good. Yep. Cool. Any more questions? Oh, Matt. Have you um, thought about, like, with decoding um, GraphQL responses, it ends up being that your actual data is within this data key. Mm -hmm. Whereas encoding them, you provide a string-based query yes. under a query key. Yep. Have you looked into the encoding of GraphQL using the same codable interface? Um, you could if you control both ends. So if you control the client and the server, you could definitely do that. Um, we tried to make a, um, we use a Scala library called Sangria, and it's just an engine for doing GraphQL execution. And it doesn't try to integrate with any web frameworks, for example. There are extensions that people have built, like we've built one, for example, on top of Finagle. Um, but um, the problem is that they're not interoperable. So if you use React with Redux, say, then you can use our server. But if you change the syntax and you changed it for the worse, so that, like it wasn't interoperable, you could support both. But if you change purely to a data format to get symmetry between your requests and responses, then you'd lose interoperability, which might be okay if you've got tight coupling, but it's probably not okay if you want to have like a GitHub API or a build card API that's a general purpose API to use. So it's almost sounding like there are variants amongst GraphQL queries you can set. There's, there's a GraphQL standard that defines what GraphQL is, and then there's a whole bunch of reference implementation fuzziness where things like HTTP, JSON encoding, you know, how do you support null keys, for example? Mm. Do you serialize them as nulls? Do you just drop them? That's not part of a standard. Um, up until recently, you couldn't do get requests in a standard way. So there's a whole bunch of fuzziness around what GraphQL is. And if you want to be interoperable, you've just got to test it with a bunch of clients. Okay. So it's pretty shit from that point of view. But if you want to just try it, you can, and you can get interoperability. Mm. Yeah. Graph, GraphQL, which is what I showed you, that web interface, is really good for that. Yep. So there's a question over here. <laughs> I can't answer that, sorry. <laughs> Thanks guys, I'm going to get off and let someone else, he knows more. Cool.